so, so pleased and proud to present Richard Salas. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Steve, for allowing me to be in this beautiful place uh, to begin with. And thank you all for coming. I know there's lots of things you can do on a Sunday afternoon. And for you to decide to spend time with me and watch, look at my photos and listen to my stories about my family and friends uh, in the ocean, uh, I'm honored. So I started to do lectures and I started to talk with people. And I started to really get the message that a lot of people really have this disconnect with the ocean. You know, whether it's because they had a bad experience or whether because they saw all those TV shows and, and Jaws and all these movies that really portray the ocean as a dangerous place. And I got really sad about that because it's been such a joy and a playground to me. So I decided that what I would do is I would help explain some of the animals and show the animals and explain some of the things that are going on in the ocean. You know, it's like fear is a really powerful emotion, okay? And the more you focus on something, even if the facts about that something, like a shark, are not true, the more fear you may have, okay? The more you focus on something, the more you have the experience of that focus. So sharks have been vilified. They, you know, every time a shark is seen anywhere, it almost makes the front page of every paper you know, within 50 miles or 100 miles, just seeing a shark in the ocean. Sharks have been here for 400 million years. It's not that uncommon if you go out in the ocean enough and you see a shark. They've been here forever, okay? So one of the things I want to do is I'm going to show you some sharks today, and I want you to all to leave here with your fingers and your arms all intact, but I want to arm you with some knowledge, some truth about sharks so that the next time you see one or the next time you see a movie or a TV show or something that's maybe coming up against that, that's trying to bring on the sensationalism of how bad sharks are or that they're man-eaters or that they're trying to get us uh, so that you'll have some truth about it. So, you know, how many people are fatally attacked by sharks every year in the world? In a year, in the world. Some people would, well, does anybody have, how many? One. <laughs> well, more than one. Yeah, it's like five to seven people. Now, how many people are in the water right now? A lot, all over the world. And how many people every year uh, are in the water, and then there's five to seven people that are attacked, fatally attacked by sharks? Now, certainly if you're one of those people, it's not a good thing. And my heart goes out to you. But you have more of a chance of, you know, a coconut falling on your head and you dying from that. In fact, uh, as far as bites, for every person that gets bit by a shark, 25 people get bit by people from New York. So they don't die, but it's, you know, it's interesting uh, statistics that a lot of people, you know, again, this fear is overblown. And what happens uh, sometimes is that people then don't care about sharks. The only good shark is a dead shark. And the challenge of that is that somewhere between 70 and 100 million sharks are being killed every year. So if you think, well, what species could withstand that sort of decimation? I don't know. Plus sharks, their gestation period on average is not eight months to a year, you know, before they're ready to give birth. Plus they have to be a certain maturity before they can give birth, and that is a lot of times from seven to 10 years. So when the young ones are being killed off by either fishing uh, methods, you know, because there's guys, you know, we have to eat. And I'm not against eating fish. And so they go out in the ocean, a lot of these fisheries, and they set out these long lines. Now, how long is a line? Is it a mile? Is it, you know, two miles? Well, sometimes it's 81 miles. Now, this is a line that's 81 miles long that every couple of feet, hooks hang down, eight, up to eight hooks, and they let this line out, and then they wait 24 hours while everything is caught. Dolphins are caught, turtles are caught, sharks are caught, and some of even the fish that they're after is caught, okay? It's just not a very efficient way of doing it, that's all. And the more boats, and there's so many boats now that do this, the more animals that are taken out of the sea. 
Now, a lot of people think, well, the ocean, I mean, it's infinite, right? You know, there's so many animals there. Over 50% of the animals on Earth live in the ocean. It's a huge place. It covers 70% of the planet. There must be enough. Well, not anymore, and not with our methods. You know, our method, we're really good at it. We have electronic this and that that will find the whole school of fish, and they'll be able to sink the net down and take the whole school of fish. Well, then what happens with the reproduction? What happens with how do those fish reproduce again? And if that happens again and again and again, it's just not healthy, you know? So a few things about the ocean, and then, I'm sorry, I'll get, I'll get to, the, uh, to the pictures, too. I did come here to show you pictures. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I was in the Galapagos Islands, um, they have a lot of hammerhead sharks there. And there was this one day where there were hundreds of hammerhead sharks. On my right, on my left, we were floating along in a current. There were uh, spotted eagle rays. There were moray eels. I mean, it was in the flow of life. I was literally in the middle, it felt like, in the flow of this amazing life. And I realized as I was looking at these beautiful animals, I think they're beautiful, a lot of people think they're kind of weird looking. I realized they don't have a voice. They can't say anything. They can't say, hey, look, you know, we're 90% we're, uh, down from what we used to be 50 years ago. And this is a problem, you know, we can't reproduce. So I decided that I would be their voice at that time. And, so, and that's why I'm doing this, this type of thing. And that's why I'm saying so much about sharks on this. And I'll, I'll show you a lot of other pictures, not just sharks. So the ocean, well, it is responsible for our climate. So we have this big body of water, and the water evaporates up into the clouds. Clouds come over, and they rain. OK, we can't live without rain. Plants can't live without rain. Animals can't live without rain. So we can't really live without the ocean. It's an important thing. The other thing about it is that every other breath that you take, you can thank the ocean for. The ocean provides us with over 50% of our oxygen. Now, most people think it's the trees, and the trees obviously do produce a lot of oxygen, but the ocean produces the majority of our oxygen. I really like breathing. So I really would like to keep the ocean a healthy place. So just a little bit what you could do. Well, you could just look at the food that you're eating, the fish that you're eating, and find out if it's sustainable. That's all. It's as simple as that. Where was this, where was this caught? How was this caught? And there's lots of websites. Monterey Bay Aquarium is probably the best one. They give you little pamphlets, and you can actually go to a restaurant and actually ask those questions. Because when you vote or when you use your power at the, at the shopping you know, level, that's really powerful, much more than I think people getting together and marching through the streets. Because if there's not a demand for it, if China all of a sudden decides, we don't want this shark fin soup anymore, we're killing all the sharks, and we're looking really bad in the world, you know, with us and with a lot of other countries, that will stop it much faster than almost anything else. So. Um, this is the mo most recent book, which is back there that I've done, is called Blue Visions. It's from Mexico, the Mexican border, down to the equator, and many of the islands. This is a s the smallest of all the islands. If you could even call it an island, it's not like you could go on it, but it's in 10,000 feet of water. It's a volcano that comes up from the bottom and stops 250 feet below the surface of the water. So as that volcano was erupting, Lava was coming out. Lava was solidified by the coolness of the water. And what this is right here is called a lava plug. And so it comes up and, and breaks the surface, and it stands about 70 feet out of the surface, about 100 yards long, and maybe 20 yards wide, something like that. And it's an amazing place because it's 320 miles southwest of Cabo San Lucas, in the middle of nowhere, in 10,000 feet of water. Okay. Yeah, it's an amazing place. So fish come, they're, you know, they're swimming in the water and they see this and it's like, oh, okay, safety. So they start, you know, congregating and, and multiplying at this place. And now it's this amazing ecosystem where whales, sharks, manta rays, turtles, you know, you name it. So this guy reminds me of my Uncle Henry, you know, who I used to, I used to, as a kid, I'd mow his lawn, you know, and he'd always be following me like this. Hey, make that straight. You know, you missed the spot. <laughs> and he's called a frogfish, and this thing right here is a lure, okay? And what he does is he moves that like this to attract fish. 
And then even though he looks really slow, which maybe the fish thinks that too, I'm not sure, but he's really fast, you know, and when that fish comes within striking distance, boom, that fish is gone. And this is at night, and these guys, see, what you see here is you see his color. When you're underwater, especially at night, it's kind of hard to see the colors. And also during the day, you know, the, the ocean or the water acts as a filter. So when light comes through the water, it filters out red, right away reds and yellows and oranges. So this guy, even though he, even if he was 15 feet down, which was probably about what he was, 15, 20 feet, you wouldn't see this bright orange color. So the surround, where he is in the surrounding coral, he looks very much like this coral. And you almost have to have someone who lives in this vicinity, which is Cocos Island in this particular case, find these things for you because you just swim around and you'll be looking and pretty soon you're out of air and you haven't found anything. You know, and these guys, this dive master will go, yeah, right there, there's one. Oh, and there's another one over there. Oh yeah, and there's one there. You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing. This guy is like having a bad hair day or something. He's got, it's a small crab, it's called orangutan crab. These are the claws right here. And his eyes, Pinocchio nose it seems like, and, and mouth. And what this guy did, he is cute. I think so too. And he's only about that big. He's a very small little guy. But he's fearless. I mean, look how big I am. And then I have this camera and housing and lights and arms and all this stuff. And I'm flashing and bubbles are exploding out of my mouth. And he's just like, okay, dude, fine, you know, everything's fine. So what happens is, again, as the particulate matter moves through the ocean, it catches on his fur. And then he's able to just pick it off with his claws. So he just kind of stands out there, you know, almost like a fishing net. And he waits, you know, for all the, all the food to come and get onto his, to his, uh, uh, his fur there. How does that happen? I don't know. You know, I can't draw a star that well. And, and just nature is constantly surprising me on, you know, the shapes and forms and, uh, you know, how it just expresses itself. This is just, it's called a pencil urchin. And <laughs> there's this star <laughs> right there on its back. It's, it's incredible. It's just, just really, really amazing. So this is what I want to see. I want to see us living in harmony and peace with these <laughs> beautiful animals, you know, with no equipment on, with just our, you know, our swim trunks and some fins or something like that. Because the more that we take care of them, Based on what I said about the ocean, the more we take care of ourselves. And if we don't take care of them, we don't take care of ourselves and our children and our children's children and all those people, all those generations to come. And so I just, you know, I just want to say that it's really, really important, as all these other issues are too, trees and you know, barn owls and all this other stuff. But what's really important with these sharks is that they are an apex predator and they do keep the ecosystem in balance. So I want to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, that's the show and I'll tell you about the book. Here comes the commercial about the book. It's a beautiful book. Uh, I put my heart and soul into it. It's not the money-making sort of thing. What it is, it's more about getting knowledge out, okay? The enemy of fear is knowledge, okay? Proper, true knowledge about things. So that you can then be armed with, okay, this is the way it is. Whatever this movie or this person is telling me is not true, and so we're not gonna jump on the bandwagon for the sensationalism of things. So the book helps me to do this and to go there. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it.